Well, if you think it's bad that they made you stand up, can you believe they're making me stand up here for this whole talk? Hey everyone, my name is Tara, and today I'm going to ask you to use your imagination to think about the web in a way that maybe you never have before. And what I'm going to ask you to imagine is a web without servers. Now, if your immediate reaction is confusion or skepticism, that's OK, because it doesn't make much sense in the context of how the web works today. But hopefully, if I tell you a bit about my background and what I work on now, it will all start to come together. My name is Tara Vansel, and I'm a web developer. That can mean a lot of different things, but for me, it basically means I spend most of my time thinking about the web or building things on the web. I'm also really interested in peer to peer protocols, and I love anything to do with nails. So if you have an interest in uh, nail art or nail polish, we should definitely talk later. The web is a huge part of my life now, but that wasn't always the case. I actually didn't grow up online. My family didn't have a computer, and we lived in a rural area with spotty internet. So my only access to computers was at school, where we mostly used them for learning how to type. Now, I did get onto Facebook, MySpace, and SparkNotes in my teenage years, but my online experiences were mostly about consuming things. I was pretty much just looking at pictures of my crush and catching up on the book I didn't read for English class. It wasn't until much, much later, when I learned about the existence of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, that I realized that I could build things on the web. This was just something I had never considered before. I assumed that building websites was reserved for super talented programmers. And this was a really, really exciting moment for me because it totally changed my conception of what the web was and how I could participate on it. But I eventually realized that after learning how to put together a web page with HTML, there was a, an important question that I needed to answer, which was how do I share the things that I'm building? Well, thankfully, the answer, answer to that question is really simple. You just install Webpack with NPM, configure Webpack, set up your local dev server, and bundle your app, and then SSH into a server that you've already set up on AWS. OK, so it's actually not that simple. Now, to be clear, I'm, I'm just poking fun at Webpack. I'm not one of those people who thinks that tools are complex and bad. I actually think tools are pretty awesome because they help us build things. And it doesn't really matter which tool you pick as long as it helps you build something that a browser can understand. Whether you write a simple HTML file or um, build something a bit more complex, your choice is valid. The point is that composing web pages is flexible and forgiving. There's room for the most beginner beginner and the most expert expert to build something meaningful. And I think that's part of what makes the web such an awesome tool set. But when I was a beginner, it was actually kind of burdensome to build and especially to share things on the web. And I can tell you it wasn't the tools that made me feel that way. It was servers. Now, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but servers suck. Um, and I think I feel this way because I started building things on the web in this sweet spot period when GeoCities had already been shut down, but tools like Netlify, Now, and Glitch didn't exist yet. GitHub Pages was around, but I wasn't comfortable working with Git at that point. So as far as I could tell, the best option for me to share the websites I was making was to set up a server. And this was pretty frustrating for me because I didn't have the time, the expertise, or frankly, the money to do that. And really, who does? There's like a super tiny sliver of the human population who knows how to set up a server and let alone enjoys doing it. Uh, I know how to run servers now, and don't get me wrong, there are days that I'm in the mood to play with Nginx or Let's Encrypt, but most of the time, it's the very last thing I want to do. And I'm sure some people in this room are pretty good at running servers, but I don't think it's fair to expect the rest of the world to be. There are 3 billion people on the internet today, and that number is only going to grow. And they're using tools like Facebook, Instagram, and WeChat to connect. And I think that's pretty awesome, because we're seeing human connection at a scale that was once unimaginable. But I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of these people are never going to participate in the web outside of the bounds of these tools. They'll post tweets, they'll share life updates on Facebook, or they'll share pictures of Berlin street cats on Instagram. 
but they'll never craft an HTML page. They'll never make um, a fan site for their favorite band. They'll never get to experience the creative joy of building something on the web that's truly theirs. And I think we have to sit with that and think really hard about whether or not that's OK. Maybe it is. Maybe not everybody wants to learn how to build websites. But I think we should be certain that the web itself doesn't get in the way of those who do. And personally, I'm afraid that it does. I'm afraid that publishing on the web is a bottleneck, that something as simple as sending an HTML file to a friend is far too complicated. I mean, think about it. If you're new to the web, you can spend months and months wrapping your head around how to write an uh, HTML page, how to vertically center divs, or how to navigate the latest JavaScript frameworks. And after all of that, you've gained your bearings, you have some confidence, and maybe you've built something you're proud of, you still have to figure out servers. And I just think the web can do better. In fact, I think it's essential that the web do better. Because if the barrier to entry remains this high, I'm afraid to think about what the web looks like in 10 or 20 years. Remember, the web has only been around since 1990. And we're already seeing the early stages of what happens when most people use a handful of platforms to participate. So how does this play out for the long term? What does it look like if 28 years from today, most people are still using a tool like Facebook or WeChat or Instagram to contribute to the web? Will it still be the web? Or will those providers have shaped it into something entirely different? I don't know, but it seems plausible. And I don't think that is a risk we should be willing to take. Because the web is too precious. I mean, it's this weird social experiment where we've built a global language for building things. How cool is that? Um, at the very least, I think a web like this looks kind of boring to me. If you were here last year, you might remember that one of our MCs, Rachel White, gave a talk called Keep the Internet Weird. And I love this talk. I interpreted it as Rachel's love letter to the kind of creativity that the web inspires when communities are nice and tools are accessible. She called back to the days of GeoCities and AngelFire when there were several tools available for folks to just jump into a browser, write HTML, and publish a website for free. But you might know that GeoCities was shut down in 2009, and it took 38 million user-created sites with it. The Internet Archive put up a valiant effort to save a lot of those sites. And thankfully, they were able to save some of the precious gifts that uh, came out of the GeoCities era. But they weren't able to save all of those 38 million sites. They're gone. I think the coming and going of GeoCities and the rise of its spiritual successors like NeoCities and Glitch tell us something really important about the web, and especially about what's missing from it. I think it tells us that setting up a server is so far out of reach for most people that they simply can't do it. And they're in they instead have to rely on tools like this. Now, I love NeoCities. I love Glitch. In fact, I think they're doing some of the most important work on the web right now. But we've been here before. NeoCities and Glitch help, help us circumvent the fact that publishing on the web is difficult. But I think we should be asking, why is it so damn difficult in the first place? And what can we do to make it easier in a way that has the kind of longevity we expect out of the web platform? I think we can make it easier. And I want to share with you my vision of what that might look like. I want to ask, what if we just didn't need servers to share a website? What if we could press a button in our browser and with one click create a new web page? Well, that would certainly be nice, but how in the world could we pull that off? Well, we have these pretty powerful devices. We have our phones. We have our laptops, right? Maybe we could just turn them into servers? Sadly, it's not that easy. Uh, there's a lot that's wrong with this idea. But to put it simply, our personal devices are just not built to be servers. First of all, we shut them off sometimes, whether it's because we've gone to sleep or the battery's dead. They don't always have a dedicated IP address, and they're just simply not built to handle the kind of traffic that servers do. Imagine publishing a video from your personal computer and having it go viral. Your computer would be flooded with millions of requests, and your home network would probably fall over in a few minutes. 
So if this idea of one-click publishing is going to work, we have to think outside of the server box. Because again, our personal devices just are not servers. Luckily, some smart people flipped this problem on its head and have found a way for regular devices to do the sorts of things that servers do without actually needing to be a server. BitTorrent was created in the early 2000s by Brom Cohen, and it's what you call a peer-to-peer -peer network. BitTorrent's key innovation was to ask, what if instead of one computer, a server, handling all of the responsibility for hosting files, what if we split up that responsibility across a network of a bunch of different computers so that any device could hop onto the network and contribute some bandwidth? And maybe some of those devices are server-like devices that live up in the cloud. And surely, sometimes, some devices will go offline. But the big idea is that regular devices can help contribute resources to hosting files on a network. And this was a really big deal. Now, I'm, I'm sure most of you know of BitTorrent because of its infamy. It was used largely for downloading um, movies and music and other media illegally. But I want to point out that it's a really cre incredible innovation that has tons of other legal and legitimate use cases, most importantly being that it made it possible for regular people with regular devices to be able to host files. And I just think that's so cool. So what if we took this approach and we applied it to the web? Websites are just files, after all. And if a website is just a collection of files, then what if we could use one of these peer-to-peer -peer networks to get a website from one computer to another? Well, it turns out you can. And I'm really excited to tell you more about that. I work with these two guys, P. Frazee and Maffintosh. And they're actually both here today. So if you want to introduce yourself, I'm sure they would enjoy that. And together, the three of us work on a project called the Beaker Browser. Beaker is an experimental browser, which means that we don't always follow web standards. But it's not because we don't think they're important. It's just that we have a few experiments in mind that we wanted to run, and we think they're worthwhile to run, even though they're not standards compliant. And the core experiment we are running is what happens when you take one of these peer-to-peer -peer networks and you put it inside of a browser. So we wanted to keep the web mostly the same, keep the browser pretty familiar, but make it peer-to-peer. -peer. And we're in a really lucky position to be able to do this experiment, because Maffintosh is actually the core developer of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol called DAT. DAT is pretty similar to BitTorrent, but um, it's got some key improvements that make it really well suited for the kinds of things we do on the web. So we took DAT, and we put it into the browser. We put it into Beaker. And we found out that some really interesting things happened, like enabling one-click publishing, giving view source some cool new capabilities, and making it possible to provide new web APIs for, to developers. So why don't I show you? OK, this is Beaker. I apologize that the tabs in the URL bar are a little small. I'll try to point out what's important. Well, on first glance, um, it probably looks pretty similar to any browser that you're familiar with. Um, it's not really remarkable in that regard. Before I show you anything really exciting, why don't I just show you what a peer-to-peer -peer website looks like? This is my website. And you might notice that instead of HTTPS, the protocol in the URL is DAT. It's really small, but just trust me, that's what it says. And it looks pretty much like you would expect a website to look like. Um, links look. Uh, work just like you would expect to. Um, images work just the same as they do in other browsers, and so does CSS. This was all uh, an intentional choice on our part. We didn't want to totally upend the web. We just wanted to see what would happen if we put a peer-to-peer -peer protocol into it. So this looks pretty unremarkable, but I actually think it's really cool, because the files that compose my website actually live on my computer. They're being hosted by my computer. And actually, they're being hosted by whoever else is visiting my computer right now. Uh, there's only two people hosting it, because I'm not very popular. <laughs> but if there were more, all of those peers would be contributing some bandwidth to help keep my website online. OK, I promised I would show one-click publishing. Let's take a look at how this works. Well, because we have a peer-to-peer -peer protocol at our disposal, we don't need a server to do this. We can literally, literally just treat this device kind of like a server, but not actually. 
So I'm going to jump to Beaker's main menu, and I'm going to click this button that says Create New. And I'm going to uh, click the website template. We could also make an empty project or import an existing one, but I'm going to use this template for the sake of time. And what just happened here is that Beaker minted a brand new website. It's pretty simple. It's just got some information about how to get started. You can change the background color here, nothing too fancy. But what I think is really exciting to point out is that this website has its own URL. I could share this URL with any of you, and if you were to open it in Beaker, because we're the only ones that support this, you could download the website right from my computer. There's no server involved here. Now, this URL is not very pretty. You couldn't remember it, just like IP addresses are pretty tricky to remember as well. So how might a URL like this work with the domain name system? Turns out it works out pretty nicely. And I set up a website to show you how that works. This is the JSConf EU subdomain on my personal website. And um, I was able to get this nice name using just a TXT record. I set this up with my domain registrar, Google, and I pointed the subdomain to the long, ugly URL. And that's all it took. I didn't have to fuss with any servers to get that nice URL. Um, I promised I would also show you view source, so why don't we take a look at what that is like in Beaker. What we're seeing here is all of the files that compose the website we were just looking at. Um, you can see the favicon here. We can take a look at the styles. And of course, we can see the HTML that we were just looking at. These files live on my computer. And if they live on my computer, shouldn't I be able to edit them? Yeah, you can. Um, we've made it possible to actually edit files inside of ViewSource. So I can click this button right here. And what I'm going to do is add a few exclamation points to this heading. And when I save it and go back to that tab, we'll see those changes just like that. <laughs> OK, that's pretty cool, but we're all developers, and we probably have preferences about our editing environments, right? We, some of us like Sublime, some like VS Code. And again, these files are on my computer, computer, so I could just open them up in my preferred editor. But before I do that, I want to turn on a cool little feature we have, live reloading. And I'm going to jump over, oops. Da, 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 da. I want to jump over to the view source tool again. And I'm actually just going to copy the path to where those files are on my computer. And I'm going to open those files up. Um, and I want to open the index.html file. And I'm going to say, hello from Sublime. Now, as soon as I click Save and head back over to that tab, we should see this change without needing to refresh. And that's just a fun little tool. OK, so I showed you one-click publishing. I showed you some of the new things that we enabled in ViewSource. But I haven't told you anything about the new web APIs yet. And before I do that, I want to give a little bit of a backstory about why we thought this was necessary. So when we first started building Beaker, we were really happy with the fact that we actually could pull off one click click publishing. But we also realized that the web is not just a collection of static websites, although it might be a nicer place if it were. So we thought, is there any way we can recreate the kind of behavior, behavior that apps on the web use doing, using just a peer-to-peer -peer network? So could we, use, uh, could we make it possible to do user profiles or databases or anything like that? And the answer is yes. Because if you think about it, a database or a user profile is typically just represented with files, right? And if websites are also just files, then maybe we can represent user data and user profiles inside of websites. And that's exactly what we and some other people who are building on these tool sets are experimenting with. Uh, this is a profile.json file. Um, and this is real. This is actually part of a profile that I use on a peer-to-peer -peer social media site. And you can see that the properties are my name, my bio, and my avatar. Um, and I think it would just be easier if I show this later to really make it sink in. So if we're going to make it possible for developers to build peer-to-peer -peer apps that use user data, 
we need to make sure that they can actually read that data and write it. And so that's why we provided some new web APIs. And they look a little bit like this. Um, but again, I think this is easier if I just show you. So I'm going to jump into the console on this website here. And let's see. I'm going to start out by getting a website, um, an object that represents this DAT website that we're on. And I'm going to use this, uh, do this using the DAT archive APIs that we have in Beaker. And I'm going to do window.location. And we now have this object, and we can do a lot with it. But I just want to show you one thing, which is that we can write a new HTML file to this website. So we're going to have a website writing to itself. OK, so we're going to do website.write file. I'm going to call it api.html. And I'm just going to write some simple markup to it. And I'm going to use autocomplete because I'm a cheater. <laughs> OK, so we've written the file. And now if we go to api.html, we can see that we've created a new HTML file. So it might not be totally intuitive at first what all this enables, but it actually enables a lot. Um, we have a whole social media application using these APIs to write user profiles. Um, it looks a bit like Twitter, <laughs> you might have noticed. And that was intentional. We wanted to see if we could replicate a lot of the behavior that Twitter provides. So we have a feed. We can look at people's posts. We can um, like posts and reply to them, of course. And I think I will uh, actually say hello from JSConf. And anybody who is following me will um, sync these changes from my profile. OK. Now, I actually want to show you my profile. This is um, pretty neat, I think. So this is an index.html cover page I have. But I want to show you what I mean by saying putting user data and user profiles into, um, into websites. These are all of my posts. And you can see that the objects that represent my posts are pretty simple. It just has some text and a timestamp. And if this were a post I had, uh, if this were a, a reply, it would also contain some information about who I was replying to. Um, I think this is so cool, because some interesting things happen when you separate user data from the application layer. Um, the application, in this case, is just sort of a view on top of my profile and uh, over top of all of my friends' profiles. And what this means is that the app and the data are no longer tied together. So I can actually customize the app with little consequence. So let's just do that and see how that would work. I'm going to open this up in view source. And I don't own this website, so I can't just edit them. I have to, I have to make a copy. So I'm going to go ahead and make a copy. And I don't like that fritter. This app has round buttons. I want to make them square. So I'm going to jump into the CSS file here. And I'm just going to search for the button class. Aha, uh -huh. here's the border radius that I want to get rid of. We'll save it. And we're going to open this up. We're going to see an entirely new social media application. And we can see that the buttons are now square. No, I. <laughs> I haven't given this specific instance of the app permission to write to my profile. That's why it looks a bit different. But if I were to select my profile and load everything up, I wouldn't lose any of my friends. I wouldn't lose my network or my content or anything. And even though this change I made was kind of trivial, you can imagine being in a situation where, on social media where a change you'd like to make is not trivial. Maybe you'd like to have some say over how um, uh, the color scheme works because you um, are colorblind. Or maybe you want better moderation tools. You're empowered to do that with this model. And I think that's just fantastic. Now, I'm not going to make any promises that this type of model, a peer-to-peer -peer web, is going to fix everything that's wrong with the web. And I'm not going to promise that an app like Fritter is going to ever become as popular as Facebook or Twitter, because they're already pretty darn popular. But I can promise that a peer-to-peer -peer web does make apps like this possible. And I can say that with confidence, because I use Fritter every single day, and so do a lot of my friends. If you want to learn more about Beaker, um, please just talk to me afterwards. I'm really excited to share uh, more about it. Or you can visit any of these links to learn more. 
Um, and I want to just end with this and say that I think fundamentally a peer-to-peer -peer web is a more fun web that no matter what your technical expertise is or your access to resources, it's a web where you can contribute, you can build, and you can share. And I think that makes it a worthwhile experiment to run, not just in Beaker, but in every single browser. Thank you so much for imagining with me.